How's it going, everybody? And welcome to the 4.0 Solutions Weekly Live Q&A podcast for Tuesday, May 24th, 2022. I'm your host, Walker D. Reynolds from 4.0 Solutions. Um, I'm just joking. Uh, actually, I'm not joking. Um, how is it going, everybody? Today, this week, it's uh, it's just me. We've got uh, Zach or uh, Josh's... Uh, uh, producing the show this week, and um, we're going to be going over uh, ITOT. Um, I did a keynote address earlier this week, or actually earlier today, like just before this, um, for an international show. I can't remember what the name of the show was. Something Connect. Uh, Connect 2022 is what it was called. And um, uh, today I presented for the um, North American audience and then i think they're rebroadcasting <clears throat> the address for their uh amea audience next week but um the topic of that that um keynote was industry 4.0 it ot convergence with a unified namespace and part of what i wanted to go over today i'm going to answer some questions that carried over from last week but i wanted to um i, I kind of wanted to talk about that keynote and some of the concepts that came up in it um, because it sort of puts together what we taught in mastermind last week, which was our introduction to machine learning. So, uh, it should be a good show. If you guys got any questions you want me to answer, please drop them in the, the chat. Uh, Josh will keep an eye on the, on the questions and I'll answer them as they come through. So, um, all right. Housekeeping, uh, some news and update stuff. Um, Monthly mastermind or mentorship call for June is, uh, remember the mentorship call is uh, every second Friday. We've gotten a lot of questions about this. Hey, what's the difference between mentorship? What's the difference between master, mastermind and mentorship? And kind of what are those programs? So I'm going to answer that question right now. Um, mentorship is at IIoT.university. It's one of the educational products that we offer. Um, it's a It's a one-time fee for... I don't want to say lifetime membership, but it's a it's a non-expiring membership, right? Um, it's a one-time fee, and you get uh, all of the step training as the, as the step training continues to accrue. You go through your self-paced learning and get certified in various industry 4.0 topics. Uh, we have a weekly call um, for about one hour, give or take, uh, every second Friday of the month. That next call is June 10th at nine o'clock central. Um, we will be discussing machine learning in that, in that call. Um, Mastermind is the program where we teach leaders on how to lead digital transformation initiatives. So that's strategy, that's architecture, that's leadership. Okay. It's team building. Um, it is less technical, although there are technical elements, it's far less technical and it's far more um, experiential learning. Whereas mentorship is teaching you technical skills, mastermind is teaching you leadership, architecture, and strategy skills. Um, we meet with that group every third Friday. That next meeting is June 17th at 8 o'clock Central. And those meetings are generally about three hours. And I, I lead the both of those sessions generally. I almost exclusively do the mastermind or the mastermind sessions. An advisory board meeting for those of you who are in the industry 4.0 community, we have an advisory board, the two co-chairs of the advisory board are Mario Ishigawa and Dave Schultz. Dave is the spokesperson and he's really like the guy who meets with me and our team to give advice on how to modify the curriculum or what type of content we should do or how did the sessions go this past month. Um, we meet once a month now. That next meeting is June 8th. So if you have any um, suggestions or recommendations, stuff we want to cover in the podcast that you'd like to see us cover in the podcast or uh, things you want to see us cover in mentor mentorship or mastermind, please, by all means, reach out to Dave and Mario and uh, or another member of the advisory board. Um, this the the next three months, this is a really important point. Um, we have reached the point in the educational program where we're ready to introduce machine learning to everyone. Uh, in the last session, in the mastermind session last week, we did our introduction to machine learning, specifically talking about these are terms you never hear me use. When I talk about machine learning, 
I try to talk about it in, uh, especially on the podcast in layman's terms. So people who are not data scientists, I try not to use any machine learning terms. Okay. I try to convert it into language anybody can understand. So what I'll say is that machine learning is used to find patterns in data to predict the future, to predict outcomes. Okay. But the mechanics of that are, you know, the two basic mechanics, uh, at least for an introduction is supervised learning and unsupervised learning, right? Supervised learning is manual classification and linear reg and regression of data points where you're having generally you're having human intervention classify objects and then you're writing algorithms to um to drive corollaries between the value of an object and the outcome of another object okay that's a linear regression and then you have unsupervised learning which is basically just using algorithms to find data or define patterns in unorganized data or the or un, the term is unlabeled data uh we have just started the introduction of these topics so in last week's mastermind we did the original the in, original introduction to machine learning which was unsupervised learning and supervised learning you know what is machine learning the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning that kind of stuff um, and then we talked about supervised and unsupervised and actual use cases for unsupervised and supervised and uh, in mentorship coming up, we're going to do a similar introduction, but from a technical standpoint. So um, the next three months, the next six sessions, the next three sessions of mentorship, the next three sessions of uh, mastermind are all going to be centered around machine learning unless some emergency topic pops up, but it, they're all going to be centered around machine learning. And you will hear me talking about machine learning a lot more in the weekly podcast because I want to keep some of the topics kind of congruent. And today we're going to, we're going to touch on a little bit of machine learning in the podcast today. So, um, the uh, C show, I, I wanted to talk about a couple things that came up in this keynote. I just did real quick. Um, it, so there were about 450 people I was speaking to this morning and my whole presentation was on OT and IT convergence using a unified namespace. And the whole, the call to action was centered around digital strategy and common infrastructure. Okay. Um, the, there were four questions that I asked the group that were in, that were watching the keynote addressed. And they are very, four very, very important questions that I ask all OEMs generally. Um, the company that I did this keynote address for is a, a company called Ovesi MDT. They make a product called, um, Octoplant, or you may have heard of it as version dog. It's called version dog. They basically make a product. They're based in, I think they're in Germany, but they, they make a product that does version control for PLC programs. Okay. Um, most of their implementations are Siemens. Um, it's a very, very cool product. Um, it's a product that is generally not integrated version control for PLC programs is generally not integrated into uh, IOT infrastructure, although it should be one of what I was part of what I was saying to these guys was like, you guys think the value in your organization is this product Octo plant that you sell to manufacturers to do version control for their PLC programs. That is literally, and it, it's really cool. I mean, it does diffs and it'll show, a diff between what did the program look like in this PLC yesterday versus what it looks like today. Here are the things that were deleted. Here were the things that were added. They're color coded. Okay. What I was saying to them was, you think that this product that people buy from you to do version control is the most valuable thing that your business has. And the irony is it is not. The most valuable commodity in your business is the data that all that software collects. So the, the data that the software collects about how organizations a write programs to automate industrial processes like the actual mechanics of writing the programs the naming standards that they use the sequences that they use um, how do they write a sequencer um, relative to how do they write um, linear discrete logic right um, you know in, in which applications do they use function blocks in which applications do they use structure, structured text in which applications are they using ladder logic? You know, you have you're collecting massive amounts of data across manufacturers on how it is they automate industrial processes, not the intellectual property of how, but the the mechanics of how. 
Um, and the future of your organization is taking all that incredibly valuable data about where, how you're collecting, not just you're also think about this version control software. If I have version control software for my PLC programs installed on day one, on the day, on the day an OEM installs a PLC or installs a machine on the plant floor. And on day one, I take a snapshot of that program and over the 10 year life cycle of that, um, that machine on the plant floor. Every day I take a snapshot of that program and I'm able to compare that snapshot with operational realities from other systems. That is incredibly valuable data. I could sell back to the machine builder. That's incredibly valuable data that the, the manufacturer could sell back to the machine builder. Think about what it is you would learn from being able to compare that over time. Okay. Here was the antecedent. Here was the operational reality that caused the technician to go take a look at the PLC code and decide to change from using a timer to a counter with a discrete block and a, and a, and a latching coil. Like it's incredibly valuable information that is incredible. That's super, super high fidelity. That is, it's 100% accurate. It is by far the most valuable commodity that that organization collects or has that the data on how PLC programs originate and how they mature over time as a function of operational challenges is so incredibly fucking valuable. It's crazy. And imagine you could share that knowledge across manufacturers. You could share that knowledge to systems integrators. You could share that knowledge with OEMs. And by share, I mean sell on some subscription basis so that for a modest fee, they're supporting the collection of that data, but they're translating that into immense value to the manufacturers themselves. Most people on that call had no, until I said, made that statement, they had never even considered just how valuable that data is. There are a lot of people in that organization. There was a guy, uh, Dr. Weckerly, Tim Weckerly, who is, uh, I think he's the chief te technical officer for that company. And there was another guy, Stefan Jesse or Jess, both super smart guys that I had worked with putting together this presentation. Um, they both understand the value of that data that they, and we had conversations about it, but the vast majority of people in the organization don't understand the value of that data. And, and I, I want to ask this question. If you are an OEM or a software developer or solutions provider who makes products using smart technology and all what is smart again, let's talk about what smart is. It can connect, it, it has connectivity into networks, and it can tell you things about itself. That's all smart is, okay? Um, um, it, it doesn't necessarily think, but it can monitor and report things about itself. If you create smart technology, if you have smart technology and you have data, because data is something that happened and when it happened, that's all it is, right? An event, something that happened and when it happened, a value and a timestamp. Let me ask you these questions, okay? What is your digital strategy for that data? Yeah, and, and it, here's the here's the mind blowing thing: the vast majority of people have nothing related to these four questions. They don't have a digital strategy. What is your digital strategy to monetize that data? Because, by the way, it's the most important, valuable commodity in your business. Number two: how do you integrate that valuable data and information provided by your products? into a common infrastructure. So the first time I looked at version dog, the first time I looked at Octoplant, they're they're and by the way, this is totally unpaid. I don't think they even paid me to speak. I think I just volunteered to do it. And correct me if I'm wrong, Josh or Cheryl. Um I, I'm pretty sure I I did not get paid to do that that engagement. Um and they're they're not they didn't sponsor this. This is totally unsponsored. When I first looked at their platform, when I first when they first reached out to me and I took a look at it, I was like, holy fuck. I mean, the second I sat there, you know, my experience with version control for PLC programs is really like Asset Center. Like if you guys, uh, any of you have ever used Asset Center by Rockwell Automation, I personally think it's the best product that they've ever made. I did an Asset Center implementation in the steel industry like in 2007, 2008. It's amazing. G great program but it's Rockwell specific, right? It's version control. It is backups and firmware updates for Rockwell PLCs, right? It's solution centric as opposed to technology driven. Um, 
when I looked at that platform, I thought, holy shit, the, the data that they collect, I asked them, first question I asked them was, what do you guys do with the data you collect on the version? Like, do you obfuscate it? Do you obfuscate this data and store it and then compare it across manufacturers and stuff? And they said they don't do anything with it. They they know they need to do something with it, but they they don't, right? And, um, and, and I think they want to, right? They're just like every other... OEMs, you know, every other software manufacturer. The difference is, is they have plans to provide value for their clients, you know, by turning that data into valuable information to make decisions. But if you're a manufacturer of software or hardware, or you're going to make some product, integrators love to do this, right? Integrators will, you know, the one of the standard operating procedures for a systems integrator is they'll create like a a starter kit, you know, or like a platform. Every integrator creates like their own little starter kit thing and they want to sell that either to other integrators or to their customers. And it's sort of the starting project to start solving their problems, right? It's got a, it's got like a little package of scripts and it's got some unique capabilities. It's amazing to me how many integrators build MES systems, um, which I think is a great idea, but it's amazing how many do. But when I ask them, when I say, well, what's your digital strategy for the data that generates and how do you integrate all that valuable data and information provided by that product into a common infrastructure for your customer? Fucking eyes glaze over. <laughs> there was like, it was never even a consideration. Oh, wait, you mean I'm going to share it outside of this platform? Oh, well, I think they support REST. I think they, you know, they could query, they, they could, you know, write a SQL query and collect the data or whatever. There was never a strategic decision on how to integrate that valuable data. Okay. So that's question number two. Question number three, and this is at the higher level, what data and information do your solutions generate that other nodes in the ecosystem can benefit from? Right. And number four, what data and information exists in the other nodes that your solutions can benefit from? Like what data does your MES system that you built, systems integrator, need to consume from other systems and how can you benefit from it? For for this software that I, I reviewed, this Octoplant version dog software, which is amazing stuff, I, I was really, really impressed. For me, if I'm as an architect, version control of PLC programming for the sake of version control of PLC, uh, PLC programs is not that important to me. It's important to maintenance managers, uh, engineering managers, controls engineers, right? Uh, oh, machine builders, that's important. But for me as an architect, it's not important. But what's really important are the trends across that. How does a program change over time if I can compare operational realities across, uh, against those changes? So what were the things that happened in the organization that drove the changes in the PLC programs? Moreover, what failures or what, or what capability gaps drove those changes? That's what's important to me as an architect. And that goes to the well, last two questions. What data and information do our solutions generate that other nodes can benefit from? And what data and information do I need from other smart things in the business um, that I can benefit from, right? Well, that platform that I looked at, this Octoplant version dog software by Ovesi MDT, it has the what. It has the what happened, okay? It has the what was the change, okay? but it doesn't have the why it, and, 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 and it's limited to what someone maybe writes in comments. The reason we made change the change was this, but what you really want to be able to do is you want to be able to did, you want to look at the digital reality of the business at any given window and compare all the outcomes from that digital reality. What were all the reactions? Here's the antecedent. Here was the reality. And what were all the actions we took? to mitigate that antecedent, that reality. That is the real value in machine learning. The real value in machine learning is finding patterns in data we can't see with the naked eye, okay? And in order to do that, you have to be integrated into a common infrastructure so that data scientists can just run algorithms randomly against all data and see what patterns pop up. Then they come up with other hypotheses to test using supervised learning models, okay? Um, there's a, a good thing that Cheryl included another thing in the slide here, which is I actually like the language in this a little better, which is it's really important to always know your digital strategy. Um, you want to approach every step as part of a greater evolution 
So no standalone projects. Um, is there important data that's not accessible to a shared structure? I would say this, all data is important. <laughs> so it, it's a misnomer to say important data, all data matters. And the mindset has to be that all data matters. And, uh, and then the last one she wrote was, uh, what's missing to connect that data to a common infrastructure, unified namespace, not a data lake. <clears throat> the structure of your business and all the events. It's like a file share to navigate your entire business. That's a unified namespace. Uh, Tomas, do you think there may be an issue with data gathered and later used for commercialization? What I mean, who owns the data gathered software vendor company using the software vendor pr uh, provides? Great question, Tomas. So um, this is a question that comes up with our clients. And those of you, most of you should be aware that we're doing in integration with three of our customers right now. Um, uh, so we have one client that we fully digitally transformed over a multi-year engagement. They're a big, you know, big part of our business. And we found out accidentally that we were working with one of their customers, one of the people that, one of the customers they sell their packaging to. We were also working with the chemical company that sells them the ink that they use to print the packaging that they sell to the, the, the soda manufacturer. Um, we approached the companies and said, we have data we think might be valuable. We have access to data we, that might be valuable to you, Mr. Ink manufacturer. And I asked the question of the ink manufacturer, the chemical company. I said, what data and information exists that your customers have? What data and information do your customers have that you would be you would benefit from if you could see it in real time. And I asked the soda manufacturer, what information does your flexible packager produce when they're manufacturing your flexible packaging that you could benefit from? And then we went to the flexible packager and said, well, what data would you like to get from your ink manufacturer? And what data would you like to get from your soda manufacturer that you sell to? And that was really the initial conversation, Tomas. It was, is there value first? There was a huge discussion. Okay, how do we do this in practice? So, our, you know, there's a UNS in it, each of the three companies. So, yes, we could, we could easily say, I mean, in like 30 minutes, you could literally set up, which is about how long it took. You set up a common broker. You set up a transmitter from each of the three locations and you transmit that data into a common location, then you give the ink manufacturer the ability to only subscribe to their data and the data from the, the printer. You give the soda manufacturer, they can only subscribe to their data and the data from the printer, and the printer gets to see all three, okay? The way we jumped the hurdle was uh, who owns that data. And we never settled on who owns it. What we said was uh, everybody owns what they can see so they can eat they're equally allowed to share what they see and we own us integrator will own the infrastructure in the middle because none of them are going to allow the other one to own the infrastructure what i suspect is going to happen to us long term and i and that th this this relationship has worked out just fine and i think as we demonstrate more and more value sharing that data across um completely separate manufacturers who have nothing but commercial relationships between one another. Um, I think what you're going to end up seeing is a standards body um, or a, or a service provider who is going to um, uh, businesses are going to pop up where the their service providers are going to enter into the agreements with the various nodes on ownership of infrastructure and data. They're going to enter into these cooperative boilerplate um, relationships. It's only really going to happen when, it's only going to happen in use cases where the manufacturer, the amount of value, like for the ink manufacturer, it's in their best interest. One of the things that they told us that they looked at, their ink is really expensive because making ink apparently is really hard. I didn't know that. I thought, you, just, you know, if you watch... National Geographic, people just smash it up in a bowl or whatever. But it turns out making ink for like heat set pressing or heat heat set presses is really, really hard. Okay. To get it so that it doesn't 
it doesn't, uh, I can't remember all the terms, but get it so that it doesn't crack or it doesn't bleed, that kind of stuff. And one of the biggest things that they needed to know is they wanted to know all of the process variables. So that is the temperature in the tunnels. So if you guys have never done printing, heat set print, printing is basically one big long roll of paper that runs through many stands. And as each stand it goes through, it does an impression and it puts a specific color on. So, you know, you may have an eight color press and believe it or not. Yeah, I mean, we all took art in school. We know that there aren't many, there are only a handful of primary colors that make all the colors, right? So most printing goes through, say a press that's got eight stands and it's eight colors, eight stands, eight colors. At each stand, only one color is applied. And there's an impression for each. And then when it's done, it goes through a, an oven, basically. And that's called heat set. And the oven sets the ink and makes it so. And, and when you look at like a, you know, a, a, a bag of your chips, that you, you know, Doritos that you buy, you would be stunned at the amount of the, the level of technology that goes into making that fucking bag. I mean, it'll blow your mind. Um, but if the ink is of poor quality, or the relationship between the ink and the process reality, the, the ambient temperature, the relative humidity in the facility, the temperature of the, the, the heaters, the, the oven that they run that finished um, through, or the, the UV, sometimes you use, use UV light to set the ink. The ink manufacturer wants to know the information about how their customers are setting their ink. Now, the way they currently do it is they'll go do a site visit. They'll you know, go out there and they'll, you know, okay, here's the reality at the moment I'm standing here and watching it. But we all know that processes change over time. Operators forget to, you know, set up, um, operators forget, you know, they'll, maybe they set the, the oven temperature wrong one time or the tension is too high or whatever. So the ink manufacturer had an, an, um, an incentive to say, yes, we'll share information about, um, our production of the ink and the quantity and, and what our current inventory levels are in exchange for access to the process variables that you have on your printing presses while you're using our ink. And what's even crazier is they, they're actually only able to see the process variables when it's their ink running on the press. And that's a function of the SKU number that's running. Um, and then same thing, obviously for the, the soda manufacturer, their incentive, their goal, operational goal was they didn't want to have to inventory any of the film that they put around the cases of the soda. So if you've got 24 cases on a, or 24 sodas on a flat, and then they put a plastic um, printed um, bag around it, what they want is they don't want to have to put that film in, an, in a warehouse. They want to be able to take it off the loading dock and take it right to the end of the line and use it so they only have to handle it that one time. And... And, and for really large food and beverage companies, that's, that's, you know, hundreds of millions, you know, billions of dollars in savings over time by not having to handle the film more than once. So what they needed was real-time visibility into current inventory levels at the flexible manufacture, manufacturer. And, and I don't mean just inventory, like what's in their warehouse, but what are they, what did they produce today? Did our role get done today? And did it get, is it on the truck at this exact moment? And is it going to be delivered to our, our dock tomorrow? And are we going to be able to take it off the dock and move it right to the end of the production line tomorrow? Um, or do we need to do a changeover and switch to a different product where we're going to have that film to reduce that double handling of the film? Um, they were incentivized to share information about their production schedule to the flexible packager in a common infrastructure. Okay. Um, Annabelle, sorry, that was a long answer to a short question, but hopefully it was valuable. Uh, Annabelle, the cyclomatic complexity of the code module over time would be a really cool parameter to track. So big O of X notation, LOC count coupling could add value. So many variables about code quality. Oh, Annabelle, you're scratch. And by the way, you're spot on there. And you're just scratching the, you're just scratching the surface of the the value. I mean, right now there are there are entrepreneurs who are watching this, you know, listening to this podcast, or watching the live stream, who are already thinking of business opportunities in this space. Because I assure you, no one's doing it. Okay, here's a really good one. I, there's an old adage, and you know, when I was writing PLC programs, um, and I still write 
programs, but I only write them when I have to now. Um, but I, I've done several um, large builds from scratch. Um, so I've done full plant builds from scratch. I did. I mean, I wrote the roaster programs for Starbucks. If you, you know any any coffee bean, if you get a Starbucks cup of coffee, that runs through a program that I wrote. No, no matter what roaster you that bean went through in the United States, it goes through my program. It's the same program in every one of their roasting facilities, Augusta, Georgia, Southern California, you name it. When I was writing those programs, when I got the sequence of operations and I got the functional specification for that project, um, I remember saying to the engineer that I was training, um, there was a junior that I was training on that project. And I said to him, there, I'm going to, I'm going to, pass on a, p- a piece of a nugget of information that was passed on to me when I first started writing PLC code. And that is this. If you give the same sequence of operations and the same functional specification to 10 different PLC programmers, you are going to get 10 completely different programs that do the exact same thing. They're all going to pass functional acceptance testing. Okay, That is the customer is going to say, you built me what I asked for. But they're going to be 10 completely different programs. That is, the naming standards will be different unless that was specified in some spec document. The choice of how logic is sequenced and how it's implemented will be different. So I may be a structured text guy. You may be a ladder logic guy. Okay, you, I may be a Boolean logic guy. Um, you're going to get 10 programs that do exactly the same thing that are completely different. And here's the interesting thing. We used to think that I.O. was the only important data in a PLC program. So that is the raw in, raw, raw out, or you know, raw engineered in, raw engineered out, in the input and output on a PLC itself. We never really considered that the underlying code, all the various steps that goes from transforming many inputs to a single output. There are many um, memory vari- variables or internal variables that are used during a sequence of logic to get you to the output, okay? We never considered that that da- that the data that was created by those internal variables or those memory variables was important. We never considered how valuable that would be to analyze. But we've realized that it is. It's incredibly important. And so, Annabelle, to your point, imagine if you start using especially... Um, unsupervised machine learning algorithms to find patterns in the way programs are written. I mean, fuck, you're going to be able to figure out, you're going to be able to look at say a thousand different PLC programs that are sampled across a hundred different PLC programmers and unsupervised learning models will be able to tell you who wrote, which of the hundred people wrote, which of the programs you'll, 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 you'll be able to tell which part of each program with a large enough sample set with enough data, you'll be able to ascertain the total number of programmers that contributed to the result I just analyzed. Oh, this programmer wrote these three rungs of logic and only these three rungs. And these other rungs were written by this other person. Think about how fucking valuable that is. Like, it's incredibly valuable. I mean, it's mind boggling when you think about it, all the possibilities. This is why we talk about how digital transformation industry 4.0 creates net jobs. It doesn't take jobs away because it's all the market opportunities that are generated by unlocking the potential in data that is all around us. I mean, really, it's mind boggling. It really is. Um, Tomas, sounds as really important discussion. Can we call it a data value chain? Yes, Tomas, that's a great way to describe it. The only thing I would say is this. I would much rather you call it a data value hub and spoke (laughs) Um, because chain delineates um, linear. Um, That is uh, the the, uh, the digital supply chain is really hub and spoke. And so I I would say, think of it more as the data value hub and spoke or the data value unified namespace. Um, Lee Taylor, can the UNS be used to ensure PLC code is working as expected without knowing the code has changed? However, I really like bringing these changes into the UNS. 
client I'm working in is putting in version dog. Okay. So let me ask that again. Can the UNS be used to ensure PLC code is working as expected with it? Absolutely. Um, what is as expected? Okay. Um, so what would you need to know? What would you need to know to confirm that PLC code is operating, is working as expected? Okay. You would need to know the optimal outcomes. You would need to know the required inputs and you would need to know the sequence of logic to transform required inputs to optimal outcomes. And you would just compare all three and guess where you compare all three. You're either going to write some embedded piece of code that's going to run on the processor in a PLC. And for that, you're going to have to get access to the firmware. You could probably do that in Opto 22 because they're basically an industrial PC that allows you to monitor the underlying logic, right? But the other way you're going to have to do it is in this abstracted layer, which we call the unified namespace. It's sort of the single source of truth where all three of those things are accessible for other smart nodes to do that analysis for you. But absolutely, Lee. Uh, Tomas, thank you, Walker. Great insight. Thank you, brother. Um, Dwayne, uh, Dwayne San Antonio, one Texas. I'm pretty sure that's Dwayne. Uh, Dwayne, if I'm if I'm wrong, if it's not Dwayne, just tell me. But I'm pretty sure that's Dwayne. Um, would you take into account just in time delivery with unexpected situations? Turnaround time is essential with manufacturing and delivery. And the answer is yes. Okay. So for those of you that are not supply chain folks. Just in time is part of the reason that we have our supply chain issue right now. The global economy had been running to just in time delivery, right? There wasn't a lot of surge capacity built in, up into the logistics. We wanted to get to just in time to reduce the amount that we handle. Here's the advantage, Dwayne, of, of analyzing supply chain in real time. Um, as it relates to the just-in-time philosophy of manufacturing. Two years ago, you guys may know, you know, I own a data science firm, okay? And, and, in, and when the pandemic started, okay, um, I was like everyone else, you know, March 2020, April 2020, you know, I was spraying my Amazon packages with bleach and, you know, didn't, go, you know, we, we, my whole family and I jumped in our RV and went to the very Southern tip of Texas and South Padre Island and didn't come within a hundred feet to anybody else. And I was just like everybody else. But during that time, I was leveraging the data scientists at my firm to analyze um, data related to mortality and all that kind of stuff. But the bigger thing we were really focusing on was what's the economic impact going to be? Okay. And by the end of May, okay, this is how, this is the power of digital data. We were able to use data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, other federal databases um, to estimate the impact, the economic impact of the pandemic. And, and by May, we, May of 2020, we were publicly stating that this pandemic will be considered an economic event and not a, um, not an epidemic. It'll be, it'll be way more of an economic event than it will be a pandemic. Okay. That doesn't mean that the lives lost and stuff aren't atrocious because it's actually true. Way more people are going to suffer because of the economic realities. And so much of that, so much of that was tied to our inability to scale supply chain to react. I mean, when the whole gov global economy shut off, you basically think of it as a, a just in time delivery is a traffic jam. Okay. So you're on the highway and you're bumper to bumper and everyone is driving at 40 miles an hour. And one guy a mile ahead of you changes lanes and cuts off the car in front of him, and he slams the brakes on and everyone slams the brakes on. Okay. Well, what happens? Like if you're a civil engineer and you've, you've studied traffic, what happens once that happens? Well, everybody behind about starting about a mile behind comes to a complete stop and sits there for a very long period of time before the everyone gets going again. And as everyone gets going again, they start to get back up to speed. And then all of a sudden, 
everyone comes to a complete stop again, yet no one slammed their brakes on. And there's this phenomenon in traffic and, and civil engineering that explains that reality. What we are experiencing economically is a function of just-in-time delivery in supply chain. However, if we, what we could do is take everything that we've learned about traffic jams, okay, if we had collected data about traffic jams where everyone's going 40, there's only one foot between each car or maybe six feet between cars, and we were able to analyze that data and we, we were able to observe that a car was changing lanes and a car slammed its brakes on. And before everyone reacted to slam their brakes on, we slowed all the vehicles down from 40 to 20. Okay. You would slow down. Then everyone would speed back up to 40 and there would be no stoppages. Machine learning, the analysis of those data patterns is what makes that possible. Tesla already does this with full self-driving. Okay. And, and full self-driving gets better and better and better every day. Um, and what we need to do now is we need to use unified namespace, um, common technology across manufacturers to do the exact same thing in supply chain. Now, the plan had been, the implementation had been, I think, you know, Microsoft wanted to do this with the Azure, Azure IoT stack. AWS wanted to do this. Google wants to do this. The problem is, is that each one of them, for the most part, they want to own a significant part of that stack. And they don't make the best products for each function in their stack. And so it becomes problematic. It's the reason we haven't seen wide implementation here. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions in here? Uh, yes. Uh, all right. General topics. I wanted to talk about something John Forbord had mentioned. So um, John Forbord on May 12th, he, he published in... Um, Richard Blanchett, hold on. Uh, so what raw data are you looking at to monitor the health of supply chain? Are you tapping into organization suppliers or can you go more macro and look at commodity exchanges? So we started with commodity exchanges, uh, Richard. The problem is, and here's the reality. Um, I had a mentor tell me this a long time ago. There's two sets of information in this world. I'm sure there's more, but he said there were two. Um, there's the information that the lay person has. And then there's the impersion, the the information that you know the wealthy and the haves have. Um, if you look at data and commodity exchanges, it is a it is a lagging indicator of the reality on the on the ground. Okay, um, depending upon the commodity, it could be 30, 60, 90, 120 days. It's a lagging indicator. It's not at this exact moment. It's a it's a abstraction or an analysis that you're supposed to use to predict, you know, 30, 60, 90, 120. But the data we're looking at in commodity exchanges isn't current. It's not today. It's a reaction to the past that happened today. Um, so it became problematic in our analysis. What we really cared about was, if I'm being honest with you, this it was really traffic data. So I, I want to be really... Uh, careful just because some of it's like intellectual property but the what we did was we we really looked at traffic data in logistics so a lot of public traffic data in logistics so shipping um uh, flight information um uh, dispatch information from logistics um, companies for trucking companies um there was some information on orders that we did do some analysis on pricing because that would gave us a, the analysis on pricing gave us a, a vin, oh, we could, gave us a window into demand and supply, but really it boiled down to traffic. It really boiled down into what was the delta between the, the total number of ships on the ocean and the total needed, the delta between the two. And we were able to ascertain the total, it, it, to keep with the metaphor, we were able to ascertain the total number of vehicles stopped on the road, if you will, behind the, the event, which is what really mattered, right? Um, let's do what the, but that's a great question, Richard. And I, I'd love to, uh, you know, if you want, I'm, 
I'm happy to have like a private conversation with you and show you some of the storyboards and some of the wireframes on how things are constructed. Um, Annabelle, hit that like button if you're finding value. I sure did. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, lagging is often better than nothing. Agreed, Richard. The reason we accepted lagging data in commodity markets is because that's all we had at the time, right? That's not the reality. The fourth industrial revolution, and we talk about this all the time, the fourth industrial revolution makes visibility into real time and compare it to past a, a reality. All we have to do is codify strategy, adopt a common technology, pick the right partners and get started and iterate, iterate, which is all we're doing here. We're trying to convince everyone that they need to be, I mean, I, I got to. I want to go back to the the Tesla thing here. <laughs> on you know on Twitter, I I keep watching. You know, everyone's like predicting, you know, Tesla's demise and all this stuff, and you know they've lost all this forty nine percent market share or whatever, or forty four percent of their stock price. The stock price that we see right now it has nothing to do with the health of those companies. It has everything to do with the confidence of the people who are investing in those companies. And you can ha you can lack confidence in a business, and that and that lack of confidence be irrational. Okay, right? It's very possible. By the way, if you want to get rich in the stock market, figure out when people are being irrational and be rational. <laughs> um, you know, the, the the Tesla is. It's hard for me to imagine that Tesla is not the most valuable company on the planet because of the data that they own. It's really hard for me to imagine that. Okay. Um, Amazon is the only other company that that's even close in my opinion. It, Tesla collects data and information and, and monetizes that data information in ways that other companies just aren't doing. Okay. Um, John McKean, I'm going to speak about this when I'm presenting at the manufacturing supply chain expo in Dublin on Thursday, all about the use of the UNS. Thank Walker for all this. Hopefully it'll be recorded. Uh, Michael Cernow, Walker's man. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. No one calls me the man that often. My kids uh, my kids do that every once in a while. I did bench 265. There was this huge guy in a Dallas Cowboys um, shirt yesterday at the gym, and he failed. He did 245. He benched 245 three times, and he failed on the third rep. So I made sure I went up to 260, actually, and I benched more than this guy, and he looked way bigger than me. And my son, Josh, said, you're the man, Dad. <laughs> it's the last time someone called me the man. Um, so Richard Blanchett, so that informs how you should react, but the indicators for when to react seem to be more important. The indicators are um, far more problematic, the indicators for, for how you should react to the reality. Uh, correct. They are, form they are much more challenging. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, it's just like when we were taking tests when we were younger, you know, taking a math test and it's, it, it, it was, you know, you had five options in the multiple choice. You basically had two ways that you could answer a multiple, multiple choice question in math. You could take the formula and solve for yourself, get your answer, and then see if your answer is one of the five. Or what you could do is just test the one of five. What we're doing right now, Richard, is we're coming up with a list of five we want to test, <laughs> and then we're testing them against the data. Okay, it, not exact; it's not an exact science, but it's better than being completely blind. Um, stock market's bipolar. Yes, it is. All right, uh, John McKeon, thanks for mentioning. I can't find the time spot of your speaking event. What day and what time? Yes. All right, I want to do John Forboard's question here because a couple of things came up. I get this question about TCP UDP all the time. Um, but John Forboard said, um, hey, this debate that's been happening in the Discord server made me think of a debate I had back in the day with a guy in IT. And John works in the OT side about using UDP versus TCP. Okay. He posed the question, but what if the message gets lost using UDP? Well, it's a real time system. If it's an old message, we don't care. That's John's response. Can't have the system act on what happened in the past. Just an example of one of the underlying differences in IT and OT. So let's talk about this because I did this whole lesson on IT OT convergence. Okay. UDP, the so the fundamental differences between UDP and TCP as protocols. Uh, TCP um, relies on connections between smart devices. So um, a TCP packet 
knows where it's going. Okay. Uh, a UDP packet does not. Okay. Uh, number two, um, UDP is way more efficient because it doesn't know where it's going and it doesn't have to worry about, um, it doesn't have to worry about confirming the message was received. So think of UDP as I just send the message and I don't care if they got it. Okay. What I care is, is that I can send the message as fast as I possibly can. TCP has all of these mechanisms in the header and in the packet to ensure I'm sending it to the right place, that that place received it and they got the right value. And if they didn't get the right value, I'll resend the value. That's what TCP does. Okay. Obviously in process control, speed and efficiency is far more important than confirmation that a message was received. So UDP gets selected over TC. This is why on a PLC, you, you always have options for setting up a connection as a T TCP or UDP on the Ethernet port on a PLC. There are scenarios where you want confirmation, especially like produce consume, where I'm, I have two, I'm talking between one PLC and another, and I'm sending an instruction between lines. And I want to make sure the other line got the instruction like, hey, that inhibit signal made it, okay? Uh, you're going to use TCP, TCP in that connection, but you're not with, you, you're going to use UDP for most of your standard process control. So if you look at the ITOT world in the operational technology world, so for like Jeff Rankin and students and stuff, you know, for, if you're a new engineer on the plant floor, you're going to see UDP on the plant floor in those networks way more than you're going to see TCP. But on the IT side, I, I don't even know of a use case where you're using UDP over TCP. Okay. You're going to, you're going to put in just a faster network. You're going to put in fiber. You're going to put in more bandwidth. You're going to put in a bigger core so that you can get all the benefits of TCP. And so when you're converging IT and OT infrastructure, so not just the data itself and the information, but the IT OT infrastructure, you have to account for the fact that the underlying elements are going to sometimes be different. And on the OT side, you deal with UDP connections far more than you do with TCP. Um, let me see here. Rick Schoonover, isn't a stock value also a possible result, the result of investors being overconfident? Yes. Again, Rick Schoonover, in the market, in the stock market, the the value of a stock is, is, is more closely correlated with the confidence of the investor in that stock than it is in the reality of the business behind that stock. Um, ba, ba, ba. Oh, John McKeon is speaking Thursday, the 26th so in the morning at 10 20 AM. John, is that 10 20 central or is that Ireland time? Um, Rodolfo Ochoa TCP UDP decision doesn't relay doesn't relay on these things, relays on your real-time requirements. Oh, I think he means rely. So TCP UDP decision doesn't rely on these things. It relies on your real-time requirements. Uh, agreed, definitely on the OT side. Um, it, it, you know, the OT network is generally owned by controls engineers. It's not owned by the IT department. Why? Because the IT department is going to apply different rules in building the network. So if you go into a manufacturing facility, it's, this is a really common thing. Like the I, IT's responsibility ends at the switch where the OT network begins. And, um, and everything on the OT network is owned by the, the controls group. And you'll see the implementation is very different. Architecture is different and implementation, uh, um, design choices, uh, protocol choices are very different. Why? Because, what drives the decision making is different in IT than in OT. In OT, it's all about production. So you're never going to trade. You're never going to trade the security of confirmation <laughs> or of retransmission that you get from TCP for the speed of higher production in an OT network. You're never going to make that. The OT person is always going to pick, pick production over the security of TCP, the, the, the retransmittability and confirmation, right? Uh, connection, you know, UDP is a connection list protocol, right? But the IT department, they don't give a fuck about production. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. They, that's not what they, they care about security and compliance, 
right? That's their primary motivator. As organizations transform, IT becomes more of a service organization focused more on solving the problems of the people on the plant floor, and that that sort of changes. They're, they they respond to a different master. Um, Mark Ritchie, any insights on malware that is specifically targeting PLCs and the cybersecurity implications to the UNS architecture? Well, part of the reason we designed the UNS, Mark, the if you look at the the four pillars of a UNS architecture is edge-driven, report by exception, lightweight, open architecture. All right, so let's talk about, let's say I want to take a PLC and I want to connect it to a unified namespace. And let's say I want to connect it to a unified namespace in the cloud, okay? Uh, how does that connection happen? Well, first off, I have to allow my PLC to talk out over whatever port my broker needs. That's the edge-driven piece, okay? So I, I give that PLC a certificate and I say, you have permission to talk to this thing in the cloud that's got uh, where you're going to send your data, okay? The thing in the cloud can only talk to the PLC over the connection the PLC generate, created. That's, a, that's an encrypted connection that is certified. The PLC is the one who made that connection with the, the broker in the cloud. And the broker can only talk back to the PLC over the connection that was instantiated by that PLC. Something else out in the world doesn't have permission to talk to the PLC over that connection, right? There's a tunnel there, okay? So, I mean, and believe me, I'm a smart guy. You know, I've hacked email servers a million times. We One of the fun things we love to do is show organizations that security is, isn't, doesn't exist. You're only as secure as the smartest person who's trying to steal your data. Um, you know, we'll bring brilliant people into a room. We'll literally say, who's the highest ranking person in this room? And they'll go, oh, it's me. And we'll go, we're going to hack your email in 15 minutes. What's your name? And they'll give us a name and we'll hack their email. We'll literally bring it up on the screen and show them, here are all your email. Here are your emails and they're on our laptop. Wait, but you're not on our domain. You didn't. How did you authenticate against AD? Well, it didn't matter. You, you think that that protected you. That gave you security. We know that it didn't, right? You're, you're only as secure as the smartest person who wants to steal your data. So what you ought to do is you ought to create architectures that don't allow the smart people to even talk to your endpoints. So the way that they used to do it because of server client architectures, this is one of my biggest complaints about OPC UA, is uh, um, you had to give permission to things outside of the OT network to talk to the things inside the OT network. You don't do that with our architecture. There is no permission for some server outside of the plant floor to be able to talk to the PLC. There's just permission for the PLC to establish a connection with a thing that's been certified as safe and only that thing. Okay. So that's one of the things that we, we talk about. Part of the architecture is designed to make you more secure, not less secure. I mean, it's designed to make you more secure. The PLC is certified to talk to that thing and nothing else. And there's nothing outside that has permission to talk to the PLC. Moreover, it doesn't even have access. There are no inbound ports opened at all. So the only way you'd be able to talk to that PLC is through an encrypted tunnel. And I want you to show me how to do that. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, hopefully that helped. Um, and Mark, what we ought to do is we ought to do a, a much bigger session on security with UNS. Uh, broadcast content uses UDP like streaming platform. Yes, Lau. Um, Kaloyan Gergiev. Do you prefer to go all in when creating a solution to the customer, offering as much integration as possible, or do you go step by step, starting small and then upgrading? Step by step, starting small. We call this iteration. Okay. So, um, digital transformation, there's a, a very specific process for digitally transforming an organization. Okay. And, and we, we go over this all the time in mentorship and mastermind. There are some basic slides that we always go over, which are the steps and keys to digital transformation. Um, we generally don't talk about them in the podcast, but I'll sort of explain it to you. As an integrator, what you're going to do is you're going to start with inventorying their business. And then you're going to inventory all the intelligence in that business. And then you're going to connect the intelligence to the network. Then on a problem by problem basis using this common infrastructure, unified namespace, you're going to start 
by integrating the data needed to solve that problem into the unified namespace. You're going to present information that will help them mitigate that problem. They will learn from their new knowledge, and then you will come up with a new problem that you have to solve. And that's the next step. You call it step by step. We call it iterative. You're going to iterate over and over and over again. That's why digital transformation, it's a strategy. It's not a project. There are many customers we work with where, I mean, um, I had a client ask us, how much is it going to cost us to digitally transform this plant? And I said, I have no idea. And anybody who tells you how much it's going to cost you doesn't fucking know either. They're just pulling the number out of their butt. But what I can do is give you a number you need to be prepared to spend over a certain amount of time. And so what I said was, my gut tells me, based on our experience, you're going to spend about a half million dollars in the next 18 months to digitally transform just the operational tech, the OT side of the business. So that is all the manufacturing processes, all the equipment, MES, get everything connected, single source of truth, single pane of glass. But what we're going to do is we're going to do that in $25,000 increments. So every four to five weeks, you need to be prepared to spend $25,000. And at the end of every four to five weeks, you will have a new problem solved on a common infrastructure. And at the end of that four to five weeks, you'll approve the solution to that problem. And then we'll come up with the problem we're going to do over the next four to five weeks. And at the end of that next four to five weeks, you will say, yep, I like it. No, I don't like it. Here's, here's the advantage of that approach for you integrators out there. The advantage of that approach is if at any point they decide they don't have any more money, they don't like what they have, whatever, they can just literally stop at the end of the four to five weeks, okay? And all of the iterations you went through provided them direct value. So they're not, there's not anything that's unfinished, okay? All they got to do is say at the end of the review, I'm done. We're, we're not, we're not going to go any further. We're going we're gonna to take a year off and just see what we can do with what we've done up to this point. And then they can resume a year later if they want to, or they can bring somebody else in, start doing it. The, it, it is a huge mistake to take the all-in approach. When a customer says, hey, I've got $5 million for your company, Walker, we, we've got $5 million for you guys to spend, and we want you to do all 40 plants in 18 months. And what I'll say is, we don't even know if that's possible. We definitely know that's not, the optimal approach. Okay. Um, Korean, hopefully that was important. Uh, John, I can't see if your presentation tomorrow stream, blah, blah, blah. hundred percent. Love it. We'll share with Cheryl D step-by-step. Step. All right. Um, I'm, we're right at the top of the hour. I wanted to finish with one other thing and then uh, we'll call it a day uh, next week. Um, one of the things I, I want to do with the podcast and I want you guys to get feedback here is um, starting next week, I'm going to invite, a member of the community to come on and sit, sit on the podcast for the whole hour. Okay. And I'll still do the majority of the, the communicating and, you know, I'll, and uh, there will still be a general topic we're going to talk about, but what I want to do is I want to start bringing members of the community onto the podcast to have these conversations with me. So I'd like to start with, you know, Dave Schultz or Mario or whoever is interested, but I would love to have people, come on the podcast and basically we just have a conversation on a topic for an hour and answer the questions very similar to the way that we've been doing it. Except for this week, I wanted to do it just myself and see just how annoying it would be if I was the only one who talked for a whole hour. And I'm, I'm actually going to listen to the podcast and, and, you know, engage. Wow, that really sucked, <laughs> you know. Um, but what I would really like is for feedback from you guys. You know, should we it, what do you think of that idea that if instead of doing, you know, an interview of a member of the community for 15 minutes, okay, what we're doing is we're just having that member join us for the podcast for the whole hour. And as a question pops up, they just ask it or I ask them a question, but we, but we're going to be talking about a specific topic. Hopefully you guys will like that idea. I think it, it'll be a great way to tweak the content and provide way more value because we'll get a, a second and, you know, additional viewpoints. So, um, anyway, I appreciate you guys, uh, um, go back and listen to the announcements in the very beginning. Those of you in mentorship and mastermind, this, what the work we're going to do on machine learning over the next three months is going to be significant. We're going to be sending out some stuff for you guys to study before we do these sessions so that everyone's fluent in the terms I'm going to be using, but we're actually going to be doing use cases in mentorship. 
So I'm going to be shit shipping out um, some content on things I want you guys to prepare <coughs> prepare for when you start testing with ML. So anyway, with that, thank you guys for watching. We will see you next week and goodbye.